Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. Today we're going to talk about Crimson Gold and... Or, <laughs> the Crimson Gold. And Crypt of the Moaning Diamond. Oddly not, the Crypt of the Moaning Diamond. As promised, and possibly a record-breaking thing here, uh, discussing two books, both by female authors. Kind of a... Um, not a rarity in the realms, but... Definitely the exception rather than the rule, though I'm going to go ahead and mess it up and talk about a skip really fast. Son of Thunder, one of the Fighters series by Murray Leader. Uh, wow, I really tried to sink my teeth into this one. I think the Fighter series is such a great possibility for people to just do balls to the wall, nonstop, insane action, fun stuff all over the place, and instead, I don't know what the hell this was about. We had like 75 different characters, and I think it was supposed to all be about an axe, but I'm not sure. It just wasn't interesting. Uh, after a while, the only people I could tell apart became not part of the story anymore. It just, nothing about it worked for me. So, skipping that one. The Crimson Gold is one of the Rogues series. And it's by Veronica Whitley Robinson, which, uh, or Whitney, should have uh, tipped me off immediately that this was going to be another Tazzy story, but I honestly thought we were done with Tazzy. So I started reading, realized it's a Tazzy story, and I was like, oh, holy crap, this is exciting, because I've liked all the Tazzy stuff so far, overall. And, you know, I'm reading the Erebus stuff right now, and so even though all the stuff going on in the Erebus Kale trilogy would make it really difficult for him to interact with Tazzy, I was like, well, maybe they're going to, you know, at least have some minor interaction, or at least she's going to think about him, and my shipping of these two characters <laughs> will be justified by the end of this book somehow. Uh, you know, because technically, at least on the timeline that we've got, all three of the Erebus books happen before uh, this book, and usually that's not a big deal as long as we're in the same year and there aren't any giant world-changing events. I know that one of the books that I read mentions the dragons going crazy, which, you know, you're the rogue dragons. I'm assuming Byers' trilogy is going to tell me what's going on there. And so that just feels like, oh, these things are happening within the same world. They generally don't cross over each other unless kind of big block print. It's like, this is a crossover. This is part one. But I thought, oh, you know, maybe, maybe this is all going to work out in some way. Sadly, no. <laughs> this is uh, just a book about Tazzy. I can't even remember why she goes to Thay, but she goes to Thay for some reason, winds up a slave, and then eventually becomes embroiled in Sastam's uh, machinations, this giant demon thing. Was it a dragon, a demon? I don't know. I, I'll be honest with you. I thought the book was really dull. I mostly read through the entire thing simply because, yes, I'm that much of an Erebus Tazzy fanboy shipper that I am like, come on, come on, something. And I think he crosses her mind once or twice in this book, but there's nothing like that. They don't get together at the end of it. She doesn't realize that she misses him and she actually is in love with him or anything like that. Essentially, she just is on this mission, uh, or she's not really on a mission. She just has to do this to escape slavery in Thay because she's kind of an idiot. I remember thinking like it was really dumb how she became a slave and, and then is trusting people for no reason. And she has this buddy who's a uh, Dwergar. And basically he does absolutely nothing through the entire book to show that he trusts her in any way. And she just keeps trusting him. And I get that, you know, it's kind of because what other choice does she have? But it's also like, why? Why would you do it? You know, like, uh, I, uh, I don't know. And even the fact that he's a psionicist couldn't win me over to thinking it was interesting at all. He just seemed annoying. So even though I enjoy Thay overall, am interested in it, find it intriguing, and even though I really like Tazzy and I've liked uh, Winnie Robinson's past books and stories with Tazzy, I still found this just dreadfully dull. Y you know, it's all kind of a non-starter. I mean, it's like, oh, this big, big thing happens, but they very quickly put the genie back in the bottle and it doesn't matter. I think, kind of interestingly enough, for kind of a uh, parallel to the Kale stuff, I, I remember Tassie goes through some sort of, she gets like dunked in magic juice and becomes superhuman or something, like she becomes like an X-Files super soldier or something like that. 
it might have gone away by the end, but I think it changes her forever, and that's like a big thing, is that, you know, Tam is like, this will change you forever, and, you know, and she's like, well, we gotta do what we gotta do, right? And he's like, I like you, you know, whatever. Yeah, so, uh, not a very interesting book, not a very intriguing book, and really not a book that tells you anything about, like, being a rogue in third edition, which I assume was at least part of the, um, the Raisin Detra for it. Not the worst book I've ever read, that's for sure. It's probably that her eyes were watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. No, no, there are worse books than that. It's a bad book, though. Anyway, on to Crypt of the Moaning Diamond by Rosemary Jones. Holy crap was this book good! Rosemary Jones is awesome. Where has she been this whole time? She just has a way of writing characters that make them pop off the screen immediately. I'm, I'm trying to think who else does this. Uh, the, the It's probably most similar to the Azure Bond stuff because it has a, I, I'm going to say mellifluous style. It, it, an easygoing, laid-back style. You never really feel like anybody is in danger because it's so easygoing. It, I kept kind of hoping that somebody would die some horrible death simply because I liked all the characters so much. It was like, oh, if that happens, if she really yanks the carpet under us that way, because they are in life or death situations every scene. If she really does that to us, that's going to make this book awesome because it's really, really good. But I think probably the weakest section of it is the ending because it just kind of felt like, okay, well, they're going to get out of it and everything's going to be okay the end, you know? I, for whatever reason, and I'd be curious to know if there was an original draft where it was slightly different, but for whatever reason, I really thought she might go dark with it. Uh, it reminded me a lot of the um, Nathan Long's Blackheart series over in Warhammer Fantasy. One of the very few Warhammer Fantasy series that I really, really enjoy and I highly recommend. Uh, imagine the Dirty Dozen set in a fantasy universe, and that's pretty much it. But there are certain points in there where essentially the main crew, even though everything's funny and lighthearted and da 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 people die every book. It's, it's intense. It's rough. And things happen, and they will just jerk you out of your chair. There's romance in this book. It's not overdone. It's, you know, um, and I guess when I say overdone, I don't necessarily mean overdone in the sense that it hits you, it's in there a lot, because I, I think if, you know, if you have a book that's a romance and you put romance in it a lot, then that's okay, because that's the point of the book. When I say overdone, I guess what I'm saying is it's not forced into it. Making you buy the romance isn't overdone. It seems very natural, very organic, very believable. There are some mysteries left up in the air. Uh, I haven't checked super intensely, but as far as I could tell at a quick glance, I don't think Rosemary Jones writes for the realms again until 4th Ed. So that's kind of frustrating. I really wanted more with this adventuring party. Kid especially seemed to have a lot more under his belt than we know about, and I would have liked to see more of it. Though, of course, Kid and the Dwarf are both fairly young, I think, and therefore they could be in her 4th Ed stuff. Who knows? In any case, I really, really enjoyed this book. It's a dungeon crawl, but it doesn't really feel like a dungeon crawl. It's a dungeon crawl with like eight rooms, essentially, total. And so, while I didn't feel that it succeeded at being a good dungeon crawl book, it's just a really good book. Really fun. As I say, the ending, not great, but, you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again, I'll take a weak third act if you give me a good first and second act. If I like the characters enough to keep reading, then I'm going to keep reading. So I highly recommend Crypt of the Moaning Diamond. No clue when it takes place. Uh, the Crimson Gold was apparently 1373. I think we are now done with the books that kind of fell out of time there somewhere. Just uh, didn't seem to have a date on them, and I don't know when they are, and I couldn't pick up any clues from the reading. Possibly those clues are in the campaign setting, but if you read the notes on uh, last last episode, or uh, two episodes ago now, you know that I lost my third ed campaign setting and uh, or campaign guide, and at the moment that I'm recording this, uh, I don't have a job, so I cannot fill in those blanks. Very frustrating, but hopefully that will all change soon, or some kind donor will step in. Think about that, won't you? <laughs> anyway, next time let's talk about Dawn of Night and the Black Bouquet. This is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.